Oh, are we on the air? Hey gang, it's Brian from FX Billiards. Today I'm gonna to give you guys 10 tips to help you make more balls on the break. Some of you might not be making any balls on the break. The 10 things that I give you today are gonna to cover some of the things you might be doing wrong, some of the things that you haven't been doing, some of the things you've never been told, some of the things you've been told but you got away from, uh, and some of the equipment questions that you might have. So first, let's start with tip number one. Tip number one, when you grip your cue, do not put a death grip on it. I know some of you feel that this is a very hard shot and I need to have a very firm grip on it. And especially as Americans, we grew up playing sports where we had to have a strong grip on an apparatus, whether it was a golf club, a baseball bat, a hockey stick, you name it. We always had to have a tight grip. There aren't any shots in pool that require a tight grip. The masse, the break shot, your regular shot, the long draw shot, all require having a light grip on the cue. Now exactly what does that mean? Because grip is a relative thing, I like to give people this example. If you're holding a baby bird in your hand and you don't want to crush it, but you don't want to let it fly away, that's where your grip should be on your cue. Not just on your break, but other shots as well. But on your break, make sure you have a relatively light grip, let the cue flow in your hand. Next tip, your bridge hand. You're gonna be making a number of different types of bridges depending on where you're breaking from. Now, when I break from this side for a nine ball rack, I use a rail bridge so my fingers are guiding the cue. You want your bridge to be pretty tight, as tight as you can get it, and still have the cue move fluidly. Now, you've got a light grip back here and a tighter grip up here. That also counts for when you were making a closed bridge. That grip is as tight as I can get it and still move the cue fluently. Now, because I'm breaking with carbon fiber, it's nice and smooth all the time. If you have a wooden cue uh, and you haven't taken good care of it, it's going to be a little bit stiff, but the best tight grip you can get on your bridge hand is gonna be great loose grip on the butt of the cue. Next thing, make sure you're following through on your break shot. A lot of guys will hold up, they get down here, and when they hit the ball, they either stop the cue or they're afraid to let it go all the way through. You need to follow through on your break shot. You watch video of slow motion of some breaks, the cue is actually following through more than any other shot in pool your cue is going to follow through. So make sure you're following through and you'll find that you make more balls on the break. Next item, make sure you're staying down on the shot. If you are jumping up in any way during your shot, you know, you see videos, especially guys, uh, I would say back about 10, 15 years ago, and, and especially the ladies, uh, a lot of them were getting airborne when, when they shot their break shot. Uh, as if that was going to put a lot more energy on the ball. Well, the reality is, if your weight is moving upwards, you're not putting more on the ball. If your weight is moving forward and you have it timed correctly, then yes, you're putting more energy into that shot. But if you're moving vertically, you are taking energy away from the shot. Now, there are a number of really good breakers that I know personally that will get down in their stance and then get more upright right before they shoot the break and they get more power that way. That's fine. But if in the act of shooting you're moving vertically, then it's not helping your shot. The interesting thing is, if you look at video of some of the best female breakers from 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and then today, their break has totally changed. You don't see as much of that airborne or kicking up uh, the, the rear leg and things like that during the break. So try to stay down on the shot. If you're gonna move your body during the shot, have your weight moving forward. Next item, what are you breaking with? Now, I've gone through everything. If you watch my channel, you know that I had a Predator BK2, I had a Lucasi uh, Big Beulah, I had 
a BK2 on the Lukasi butt. I've broken with, with a Predator 314. Right now I'm breaking with a Predator BK Rush, uh, which is absolutely the best brake cue I've ever had in my hand. Uh, it kind of combines all the things that I was trying to achieve with the other cues. It gives me the control that I have with a 314. It's low deflection. Uh, when you add in the fact that it's carbon fiber and has one of the best tips that I've ever seen on a brake cue and how does the tip get better on a brake cue than others. Um, on brake cues you have a very hard phenolic tip and this one actually it has a little um, grit to it that I didn't find in other brake cues so I have a lot more control over the cue ball. Uh, I assume that was something that was intentionally done because you know they got the best technology in the world over there but at the same time I've found that I make more balls with this cue and I keep pretty good records as far as what I'm breaking with. So whether you have a Rush, a BK2, or, or any other brand cue, uh, make sure it's something that number one, you designate as your brake cue, even if it's not a professional brake cue, but number two, has the characteristics of a brake cue. Now what should they be? Uh, if you can Budget carbon fiber, I definitely recommend that because it's just so much consistency whether you're shooting with your normal game or you're shooting break shots. You want to have a very hard phenolic tip, um, which you know any professional brake cue is going to come with. So you want to have a hard tip. If you're building your own brake cue out of a spare cue or something like that, find yourself a hard tip to have put on there. Again, the phenolic tips tend to be the very best and they're gonna last forever. Uh, if you're putting together your own cue from an old uh, playing cue, the phenolic tip might pop off, but if you're buying a designated brake cue, then you're gonna have a phenolic tip on there anyway. Uh, big controversy. This is not gonna put it to an end, but I'm gonna tell you the facts. There's been a lot of study done as to what weight your brake cue should be. Should it be lighter? Should it be heavier? The jury's been out, guys, for almost 10 years now that a lighter cue breaks better than a heavier cue. I know that the heavier cue feels better in your hand. It feels better in my hand as well. But the reality is you break better with a lighter cue. I know some of you have went out and purchased 25 ounce cues and I would recommend that you run some tests. Shoot 50 breaks with that, shoot 50 breaks with a house cue and see how you make out. So keep in mind that the lighter cues have been proven to get more speed on the cue ball and because you got a very, keep in mind you have a very short distance for that cue ball to pick up speed and all the best breakers in the world are using cues that are 19 ounces and lighter. So that's another point that you guys should keep in mind. Let's talk about force versus finesse. If you go back again 10 years ago, because a lot of things have changed ten, in the last 10 years. Um, if you go back 10 years ago, everyone was concerned about brake speed. There were brake speed apps. Predator has a brake speed app that you can get for your phone. I do recommend you know, purchasing one because it is uh, probably a dollar if it's anything at all. And uh, it will give you an idea of what your brake speed is. But at the same time, going back 10 years ago, everyone was obsessed with brake speed. Today, everyone is obsessed with control and making the wing ball and make sure the cue ball doesn't get out of control during the brake. So all of these things are factors, but if you can consistently make the wing ball on a nine ball break, or one of the two behind the one ball uh, in an eight ball break, you're going to be at the table and you're still gonna be shooting. And trust me, it doesn't take a lot of force to spread a nine ball rack or to spread an eight ball rack. I always say in these videos, I, be, I break probably at about 80% of my maximum speed, and I get some pretty good breaks. I mean, I've made four, five balls on a break, and we're talking about some nine ball racks where I actually made four or five balls. So I'm not even hammering those balls, but they're spreading out and they're spreading out well because you don't need to put a lot of force in it if you are breaking with control and finesse and hitting the balls in the right spot. Let's talk about where you're hitting the balls. 
one and eight ball break. I generally, because I'm coming from that direction, put the cue ball just about here. Maybe a um, ball's width away from the spot and I get up on the head string, but I'm still behind the head string. So I don't get all the way up on the head string. I use a closed bridge and I come into the rack right here. Now, if the camera is 12 o'clock, I'm coming into the rack just about one o'clock. I'm putting some low on that ball because my cue is going to stay down. Remember, stay down. I'm putting low on that ball and getting a little bit of control from that. You can also come in at around the two o'clock mark and use low with English to come off of this rail here and try to find yourself in the middle of the table. You should have a target when you are breaking. I showed you what my target is when I'm breaking here. If I'm not making a ball on the break and I'm playing eight ball, I will move the cue ball along this line, left and right, and aim at the exact same spot that I was aiming for before. Now, what this does is it gives me a different angle. If the table is running different or I'm on a different size table, this is an eight foot table. If I'm on a bar box, things are gonna roll a little differently. So I might start moving the cue ball along that, that line to make adjustments as to where I wanna break from. If you're on a nine foot table, it's gonna be a slightly different angle from here to those side pockets. But the moral of the story is you have to have a target. That's my target on this. I have other videos that get more in depth as far as how to break for eight ball, nine ball, and 10 ball. Check those out. But in the meantime, make sure you have a target. Let's talk about your nine ball break. The nine ball break is the most predictable break you're going to find. You can tell where almost each one of those balls is going to be headed. It won't always happen that way because again, they collide into each other, but it is very predictable as to where that first ball is gonna go, where the wing balls are gonna go. A lot of people are racking now with the two ball in the rear. And the reason is the two ball is less predictable when it's in the rear. And some of you beginners might say, what's up with this two ball? What difference does it make? Well, the reality is a pretty good breaker is gonna do one of two things with a nine ball break. They're going to, number one, they're gonna always send the um, wing ball to the pocket. 85% of the time is where I'm dropping it in this pocket over 85% of the time. And by the way, the other 15% of the time, something else is going because I did 100 breaks for a video and had zero dry breaks. I did scratch five times, so those are dry breaks. In the meantime, there's a couple things that are happening. The one ball is either going to go in the side pocket or it's going to end up at that end of the table. So this is where the importance of the two ball comes in. If the two ball is in the rear of a nine ball rack and you can't control where it's going to go, because a lot of times it actually heads to the same pocket as the wing ball. When you miss the wing ball, it's usually because that rear ball came along and knocked it out of the way. But you have less control over it. So what happens? What happens with that rack? Let's say you're the greatest breaker ever and you left that cue ball sitting here. Your one ball, if you're breaking from that end, is down there or it's in the pocket. But most likely it's down here and your two ball, because it was in the rear, is either down here or it fell in the pocket with your wing ball or where your wing ball was trying to go. So controlling the two is that important. If I can get the two ball down table with me, now I've got the one and the two to get position on the three wherever it is. To some of you beginners and low intermediate players, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but I've got two balls that are at the same end of the table that are gonna be relatively easy for me to utilize to get on the three ball. Because remember, I don't have to make those balls. I get to make those balls. I get to use those to get me position on the next ball. So that's the importance of the two ball for those of you who have been wondering. Little tip, if you go into a tournament and it's been going on for a while, you can see the hot spots from where people have been breaking from. Those are probably going to be the best places to break from. If you go into a pool hall, you can find the hot spots from where people have been breaking from. 
I don't know if you guys can see it on camera, but I usually break with the balls down at that end. And you can see very distinct lines on my table from the path of my cue ball going over and over again. Not just from this side, but because I switch up from this side as well. Now, if you haven't seen my videos uh, talking about breaking nine ball, and you're wondering, well, why does this crazy guy switch up his break from one side to the other? This is the reason why. I am a favorite to make the wing ball no matter which side I'm breaking from. If the wing ball is a dark ball like the, the six ball or the eight ball, I break from the side that is going to make that ball. Might not seem a lot to you guys, but it is more difficult when you're shooting down table at a darker ball than it is when you're shooting at a brighter ball like the five ball, for example. So if I get the five off the table, I haven't really done myself any justice. Even the four ball, it's a little darker, but relatively easy to see. The eight ball and the six ball are probably, if there was a scale, probably two of the most difficult balls to make when you're shooting down tables. So if I'm gonna have any kind of difficulty with a ball because of its color, I'm gonna get it off the table during the break. So that's why I break from this side if my wing ball that I wanna make is on that side, or this side if the wing ball I wanna make is on this side. If all things are even, and say the eight and the six are here, I'm always breaking from that side. That happens to be my strong side even though I'm right-handed, and it may or may not be your strong side, but that's where it comes in, where you're experimenting with your break and you're doing tons of them over and over again. Very quickly, let's talk about racks. This is a magic rack. To those of you who are relatively new to the game and have never seen one of these, I don't think there's many of you, but, but this is a magic rack. What happens is you put the rack on the table and the balls go into these little spots here and what happens is they sit perfectly on those little diamonds which gives you a tight rack each and every time. Now a lot of purists don't like the magic rack because there's something alien on the table now. Uh, one guy hit me in the comments he said you know Willie Moscone would be rolling over in his grave with this magic rack thing. Well, the reality is, uh, first let me qualify this before I beat up on Willie. Willie Moscone is the reason I play pool today. When I was a kid, there was only one pool player that I was concerned with, and that was Willie Moscone. So I play pool because of Willie Moscone. That being said, today Willie Moscone would not have a choice about it because most events he goes to, they're going to be playing with a magic rack on the table. Second thing, Willie Moscone was a very bright guy and he would love the magic rack because the rack is the same every time. What do I mean by that? I'm the worst racker in the business. I have had more people ask me for re-racks than anybody I ever, I ever met. I tell people all the time the reason I'm a bad racker is because I'm usually the guy that just won the game, so somebody else is usually racking for me. But I honestly, I'm terrible at racking. Why should you have a different break because I rack the balls and there's gaps in there than somebody else is having when Joe Smith, who's the best racker ever because he loses game after game and he's very good at racking now, <laughs> so he racks, you got a beautiful tight rack where all the balls are touching each other and everything is frozen and then Brian racks and there's all kinds of gaps in there. It might not even be straight on the table. So the thing that Moscone would love about the Magic Rack is the fact that it is the same rack every time and those balls are gonna be spread out every time. Now, are there times that there are balls left touching the Magic Rack? Obviously, yes, but you know what? There are literally thousands of matches being played all over the world with a Magic Rack or a similar product on the table and no one has once lost a match because that thing was on the table. You can usually take it off right after the break or soon after the break, and um, unless the ball is rolling at a very slow pace, 
it's usually not going to alter the direction of any balls that are on the table. So that's my commercial for the Magic Rack. I don't have an endorsement deal with the Magic Rack, but just something to, to know about um, why we use a Magic Rack and what the deal would be uh, if some of the purists from the past, some of the classic guys were playing pool today, they would embrace the Magic Rack because it is consistent every time all of those balls are touching. That's all I have for you guys. If you have any other tips on breaking that I haven't covered, or you want to debate this weight of the cue thing, the magic rack, any of that, put it in the comments. By the way, I will not debate the use of a magic rack or the weight of the cue because these things have been proven. They're not my opinion because I'm a purist. And trust me, if I could break better with a heavier cue, I'd love to have a heavier cue. And if anyone could break better without a magic rack, I don't like it on the table, but I can tell you that you're gonna make a lot more balls on the break and you're gonna get consistent racks. So I'm not a guy that wants it on the table, but it's there and it's a good thing. So have a great day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit us in the comments, give us a like, all of that good stuff. If you haven't subscribed, you better get with it. We're about at 25,000 subscribers coming up soon, which means contest time. And our contests are reserved for people who are subscribers. So make sure you are subscribing to FX Billiards. Hit us at fxbilliards.com. You can get some more information. Uh, if you're interested in taking lessons or anything like that, that's where you can do it. Have a great day. Thanks for watching.